Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Your daily encouragement that God has the world in the hollow of his hand. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles. Arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise. By your power, we will go. By your spirit, we are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Sometimes I just want to say things, and then I wonder, is that appropriate? And then I hesitate and then I say no I think I still want to say it so hey good looking what you got cooking you know sometimes you just you just want to say something to your friend and you know it'll get a chuckle you know it'll raise their spirits just a little bit so um so good morning I'm Carmen LeBurge you're listening to mornings with Carmen what's on your heart this morning um is there a a heart hitting news story where you live um sometimes the news is is whatever's happening closest to home, um, just outside our door um, or just down the hallway from where we're sitting right now. So the heart hitting news may never make the news, um, but the good news of Jesus Christ is brought to bear on all of it. And so what's on your heart this morning? What are you thinking about? Um, What are you worried about? I'd like to know. Um, and so you could text me, 877-933-2484. Um, yes, I am looking at you, Mary, praying for your sons. Yes, I am uh, looking um, on the, um, yeah, I'm I'm looking at you. I see you out there. I see what you're, um, what you're thinking about and what you're dealing with. Um Jill, I see you. Mark, Cindy, Kathy, Sarah, I see you. Deb, I see you. I just sent you a message back if you're um, back on the text line now. I see you, David and Carolyn. I see you, Debbie. On and on and on. See you, Bob. Yep, thanks. Checking in. Oh, Andrew, yes, I see you too. Um, there are some people who feel totally unseen and forgotten. Do you remember the Maui fires? Remember those? Remember the town of Lahaina? What about Kula? In the midst of all of our conversations about the horrific fires that swept across um, a portion of the Hawaiian island of Maui, we talked a lot about Lahaina. We focused our attention on the town of Lahaina. Government efforts are still focused on the, on the city of Lahaina. What about Kula? Never heard of it? Me either. Me either. Kula is a small town, um, maybe even a rustic area. Uh, it is on the slopes of Halakalaya, the, the, you know, the slope of the volcano there <clears throat> on the island of Maui. It's considered upcountry from Lahaina. So imagine that from the seaside, you know, the oceanfront community of Lahaina, you looked, quote, up country. Well, that's where Kula was. And I use the term was because Kula is basically no more. 6,500 people live in Kula. Um, It's a community that's rural and prides itself on having above average schools. Um, And In the piece that I read in the Washington Post um, about the Maui fires and the ongoing efforts to clean up and the efforts to begin to rebuild, these are some of the, these are some of the lines from the article that I just thought, you know, wow, a Christian standing there hearing this would immediately have something to say. No one is coming to save us. That's, That is the lead quote about how the people of Kula, Maui, Hawaii, feel no one is coming to save us. They also acknowledge that 
their place, their space, their home, their community is, quote, savable. So put those two things together in your mind for just a moment as a Christian. There is the possibility of something being saved, but no one is coming to save us. Do you see the opportunity there? Um, And so let's just apply that closer to home. Wherever you live right now, I want you to ask yourself, who feels like no one is coming to save them, but who is savable? Because the people in um, Kula, Maui, Hawaii, you know, now their news story is headline news. And so trust me when I tell you, (laughs) uh, help is very likely on its way, right? In in a form that, that will be genuinely helpful to that community. But let's think closer to home for each one of us. Who is living just beyond the edge of the government's effort to help? Who is living just over the limit or just beyond the line? Who, you know, a person in proximity to you today, a family in proximity to you today, somebody who feels like no one is coming to save them, but who is yet savable. How might you tangibly love them today? How might you be the agent of grace or the ambassador of the king and the kingdom that knows no limits when it comes to seeking and saving those who are desperate and in despair? Who do you know that thinks, quote, no one is coming to save me? And how could you demonstrate otherwise today? And I'm not saying that we can provide all of the food or all of the shelter or all of the transportation or all of the medical care or all of the child care or all of the respite care for every person out there who has a family member with special needs. But we can do something, a cup of cold water, a bowl of soup, a night stay, a place to shower, a clean bed to sleep in, a church community that is welcoming and praying and careful, full of care. So what if we just went and asked? I mean, if you walked into a charred community, a, a, a town like Kula that's been burned down, you wouldn't hesitate to ask, what do you need and how can I help? You just wouldn't. But there are people living in ashes all around us whose lives have been burned down. Could we just ask them today? Could we just go and ask them, what do you need and how can I help? That's the challenge I'm setting before us because there are people out there thinking to themselves, no one is coming to save me. And yet they are savable. And we are the ambassadors of the one who came to seek and save the lost. So in the spirit of Christ, let's go and ask today, what do you need and how can I help? This is a Super Bowl weekend, so we thought it was time to catch up with our friend Jason Romano from Sports Spectrum. All eyes are going to be on Vegas. Uh, Jason is already there, um, pulling the um, pulling the faith threads that he can find to pull um, in the conversations among those related to uh, the two teams competing for this particular NFL honor. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen, so this is like our sports segment up next with Sports Spectrum. Well, you already know it's Super Bowl weekend. So joining us is Jason Romano from Sports Spectrum. You can find the stories that we're going to be talking about today and a whole lot more coverage at SportsSpectrum.com. Jason, welcome back. Hi, Carmen. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. So you are in the city where the thing is happening. So talk with us about your experience (laughs) um, in Vegas and what, um, you know, like, for people who don't follow football at all, who's playing in the Super Bowl, and what's your favorite storyline? That's that's great. Uh, yeah, Vegas is interesting. This is my first time here, and uh, we're staying at like a little Airbnb away from the Strip. So we're in just a basically a, a, a regular town, just like any other town with WalMarts and Targets and gas stations. So we're we're a little bit away from the hubbub when we're home. But when we go to work and we go into the media center, that's at Mandalay Bay. Uh, which is a huge hotel Mm -hmm. right across the street from Allegiant Stadium. And that's the stadium that the 49ers and the Chiefs, the two teams that will be playing on Sunday, uh, will be playing the game at. It's just a giant stadium. We were inside that stadium on Monday night 
uh, to cover Super Bowl opening night, and it's enormous. And it's neat, though. This is this is pretty cool to be down here. Uh, I mean, I'm guessing, especially from believers, like Las Vegas gets a, a bad rap, you know, Sin City and all that. But, um, but I think God is doing some cool things here, especially with the opportunity that we have with Sports Spectrum to ask questions to some of these players and coaches as we get to do every year uh, about Jesus and asking them about who who God is in their life and what they're learning. And I got to tell you on Monday night when we got to talk to a large portion of the Chiefs and the 49er players and coaches, it's chaos, right? There's thousands and thousands of media sticking microphones in their faces, uh, dressed up silly. They're getting the weirdest questions ever. And I remember one at one point, I went up to one of the wide receivers of the Kansas City Chiefs, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and I just said, I'm going to ask you a question I bet you you haven't gotten all week or all day. He goes, okay, try me. I said, tell me about Jesus Christ in your life. And he just lit up, big smile. His eyes got big, and he says, he's king. And I just thought, that's awesome. And we got to talk to him and, and many others about it. So it's been a fun week and, and uh, got a few more few more conversations to have this week before we head back home. So the Kansas City Chiefs um, and the San Francisco 49ers, um, we're not taking yeah. sides because we've got Christians on, on both sides of the ball here. Um, talk with us about Brock Purdy for people, again, who don't follow football. Who is Brock Purdy and what did you, what did you hear from him? Yeah, so if you don't follow football at all, if you don't have a team to root for, but you want to root for something, root for number 13 on the 49ers. That's Brock Purdy. He's the quarterback, starting quarterback. And anytime the starting quarterback is, you know, featured at the Super Bowl, all the lights and all the cameras are are shined on this person. You know, on the Chiefs, it's it's Patrick Mahomes. And for the 49ers, it's Brock Purdy. But Brock's story, I think if he had somehow wins the Super Bowl on Sunday night, if the Niners win, it, it's going to go down as maybe the greatest underdog story the NFL has ever seen. So this guy... First of all, he loves Jesus. And when I say that, I mean that. Like, this isn't just a surface level, God is good. This man has the Holy Spirit in him. This man loves the Lord. And uh, we've had an opportunity to talk to him on multiple occasions. But this story of Brock Purdy starts, it goes back two, three years ago when he was in college at Iowa State. He was getting ready to play his senior year. We had him on Sports Spectrum. And he wasn't sure if he was going to be able to play at the next level. He certainly wanted to, but he wasn't sure. And then he gets drafted, but just barely. He's the very last pick in the NFL draft. The NFL draft has seven rounds and, you know, 32 teams. So you can do the math. It goes to, you know, in the, in the hundreds and hundreds of players, Brock is the last player picked. Now, he's happy to be picked, but he's the last player so what does that say? There's a, you know, hundreds of players selected before him, but it was the 49ers that drafted him. So he comes in his rookie year last year in 2022, and he makes the team, which is an incredible accomplishment. And then injuries happen to his other quarterbacks that he's waiting behind. And suddenly he's thrusted into the, into the starting lineup and he crushes it. He does so well. And the Niners go all the way to one game before the Super Bowl. But what happened in that game, Brock hurt his elbow and tore it up and, you know, the 49ers lost and it was a devastating thing to happen. And we got to talk to him right after that. And he still found joy. He still found peace. He still was talking about how great God is. He went through the rehab last summer. He comes to the 49ers this past season and he starts and he crushes it even more. And he's one of the top quarterbacks in the league. He's an MVP, most valuable player candidate. And he takes the 49ers all the way to the Super Bowl. And just yesterday on Tuesday, as I'm recording this with you, I was with the 49ers team media availability. We talked to Brock Purdy. We asked him a couple of questions. And he had the same demeanor, the same answers about how Jesus is Lord that he had when things were at their worst. And I was just so impressed. So when you watch him on Sunday – even if you're not rooting for the Niners and you happen to be a Chiefs fan, man, root for Brock Purdy because he is a guy that is just awesome. Mm, that's so good. Um, we're going to continue our conversation with Jason Romano from Sports Spectrum here in just a moment. Who are you rooting for um, on Sunday at the Super Bowl? 
It might be the Kansas City Chiefs. It might be the San Francisco 49ers. We want to be talking about the guys who are the Jesus guys on the field, the Team Jesus. And so we'll talk next about um, more members of the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers who are on Team Jesus. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. How are you preparing for the reality of Jesus's last days, his passion, Holy Week, the Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas's betrayal, Peter's denials, Jesus being stripped and humiliated by soldiers and falsely accused by the Jews and subjected to mock trials and ultimately crucified. How are you planning to give those events in Jesus's life the attention they deserve? That's what the season of Lent is all about. The 40 days prior to Easter are set aside to prepare ourselves to face the reality of the cross and, yes, ultimately to celebrate the reality of the empty tomb. I invite you to join us in reading through the Bible together during Lent. The study will provide a way for you to intentionally engage each day with the Word of God. You can sign up today at MyFaithRadio.com as we read through the Bible together this Lent. Continuing our conversation now with Jason Romano. Check out what we're talking about today and a whole lot more at sportsspectrum.com. Um, all right, we have talked a little bit about Brock Purdy from the 49ers. Do you have a storyline for us from the Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah, thankfully, there's been quite a few. Uh, I mean, the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl for the fourth time in five years. So when you cover a team, four times in five years, you're really searching for new stories. It's hard because <laughs> there is there is turnover in the, in the NFL and certainly with the Chiefs. But, you know, there's a lot of guys that have been there for four times in five years. So it's like, do we just want to talk to the same people every year? And what's beautiful is every year we get to talk to the team chaplains of both teams and they'll kind of, you know, slip us a couple names that, you know, maybe we haven't talked to that have been growing in their faith. And one of those guys that we got a chance to talk to this week was Trey Smith. He is an offensive lineman for the Chiefs. An offensive lineman is somebody who blocks uh, when the Chiefs have the ball for Patrick Mahomes and for those running backs. And he wears number 65. And, man, he's got an incredible story. This is a guy who in college was really, really good at Tennessee. And then he was having some trouble in workouts and didn't know what was going on. And he went to the doctors and they found a bunch of blood clots in his lungs. And it's kind of a crazy story. And yet, thankfully, he got treatment. He was fine, but he slipped in the NFL draft and went way down to the sixth round. He was supposed to be a first round top draft pick. And he slipped all the way to the sixth round and the Chiefs drafted him. And so he came into the NFL a couple of years ago and he started every game since. So on the field, he's a great story. And then off the field, it's really awesome to watch him talk about his faith and his purpose. When we saw him on Monday night at media night, you know, we asked him about the importance of his faith. And he just said that, listen, I, I was raised the right way by my mom. I was in church. And to this day, that is the seeds that were planted that allow me to continue to follow Jesus today. And I just thought that's a great reminder, right? Like for so many of us, some of us, who have kids, you know, and we want to do right. We want to raise them right and get them in church and get them in Bible studies or, you know, kids church, whatever it is. And then maybe they're straying a little bit, or maybe they're just not living a, a perfect life that you would hope. None of us are perfect, obviously. But then, you know, when you hear Trey Smith's words and you're like, listen, my faith now in my mid twenties, 24, 25 years old is the central part of my life. That's because mom, that's because growing up that I just thought, what a great reminder for all of us that the seeds that we're planting, you know, God's going to con can, can continue to use them, even if in the midst of situations that maybe it doesn't look like he is. And those seeds, those foundations, they, they get planted pretty well, I think, inside our children. And, um, and that's why we got to keep praying, obviously. But Trey's a great story for that, I think. So if you check out sportsspectrum.com, you'll see there the Sports Spectrum podcast. And there, um, there's a conversation there with the chaplain from the Chiefs and another one with the chaplain for the 49ers. And that'll be an encouragement to you as you think about how these teams made their way to, um, to this Super Bowl. Um, Jason, when you, when you think about well, first of all, you just said, you know, they're 24, they're 25 years old. Like, these guys are so young. I definitely forget oh, yeah. that. Like, I... Yeah. they're so big. They're, 
<laughs> they're such <laughs> that's like, true they, too. <laughs> they're such men, um, but they're they're so young. When you think about um, maybe just take a step back from the these particular storylines, like yeah. are there are there are, is there a generation of uh, of people that are really like mentoring and pouring into players? Because I feel like, you know, we know that this generation of emerging adults and very young adults, like they long for that. They really want mentors. Do you do you see people pressing into those roles? Yeah, that is a great question. I think I do. And I'll give you an example. In in Houston with the Houston Texans, um, you know, obviously they're not playing in the Super Bowl, but they had a really good year. They drafted a kid named C.J. Stroud, who is a quarterback, and he started right away. He's sort of the prized possession, if you will, of of the Houston Texans as a quarterback and as a guy who they're going to build their team around. And Man, did he produce this year on the field. But holy cow, does this guy love Jesus? He's very much in the vein of Brock Purdy as far as Holy Spirit-driven, bold in his faith, outgoing about Jesus. But he's also 23 years old or 22 years old. And so where does the mentorship come from? Well, Houston did a great thing. They brought in a guy named Case Keenum, who if you're in the Twin Cities, you know that name very well because he was the quarterback of the Vikings a few years back when the Minneapolis Miracle, when they beat New Orleans. And Case Keenum now is 37 years old. He's not old. Mm. I mean, that's much younger than I am. So I, you know, I go back to 37 any day, but he's 37. He's been in the league 13 years. And, you know, he probably isn't, the player he used to be. He's not going to be playing every week, but they brought him in as a mentor. They brought him in as the guy to say, okay, CJ Stroud, we love you. You're our rookie. You're our first round pick. This guy, Case Keenum right here, he's going to mentor you. He's going to be there with you. And Case took on that role. And Case is a Christian as well, a believer. And we've known Case for a long time. That guy pouring into CJ Stroud was an intentional move by the Houston Texans because they know, like you said, that these young people are just craving for mentorship. And I think we're seeing that more around the NFL um, in different facets, right? Like a team might be intentional like Houston is, but sometimes there's just these older guys who are just making themselves available. You know, the retired players, they're in their late thirties. They might be in their forties or fifties. And they know these young players just look up to them and see them and say, wow, that's such and such. But these older players, I think, have made themselves available to be mentors. Hey, here's my phone number. Call me for any questions. Um, so I think I think it's getting better. And I think we're seeing that to be more intentional by the NFL and certainly by the players that are, are playing and the players that have played. So I um I really love and appreciate that during this week in the lead up to the Super Bowl there's all kinds of ministries actively engaged um you know yes. whatever the whatever the particular site of the Super Bowl is in a given year. So this this year one of the things that you have highlighted is the Athletes in Action 36th annual Super Bowl breakfast um yes. and and you know who they intend to um who they intend to to highlight and celebrate um, and so could you just maybe help people understand that the Super Bowl isn't just, a, you know, an event that takes place on this coming Sunday. Like there's ministry happening around the Super Bowl all week. Yes. In fact, on Wednesday night, they held a thing called Huddle for Hope, which mm-hmm. is a gathering middle of the week at a church here in Vegas that I'll be at and uh, you know, a bunch of players and just other people who work in sports that are in town for the Super Bowl, you know, perfect little midweek break from the craziness of covering the Super Bowl. And we're just going to be there to, and, and players are going to be there as well to to honor the Lord, to worship, to pray and to hear the word of God. Like, so that's intentional, right? And then the mm-hmm. Super Bowl breakfast, that's something that they do every single year. It's actually sanctioned by the NFL. And it's really... <laughs> It's advertised more as a faith, family, football event. But when you go, like the gospel is shared every single year at this Super Bowl breakfast, usually by a current or a former player at the very end of the breakfast. But people that go, they go and there's a lot of non-Christians there. So it's it's a very intentional move by um, by the Super Bowl breakfast committee, by Athletes in Action, which is just such a great ministry. Uh, they do such great work 
you know, providing access to athletes uh, and others in sports, particularly in the college space, but even in the NFL as well, to grow in their faith, to get Bibles in their hands, to be mentored, to be discipled. And then they have this breakfast and, you know, there'll be a couple hundred people there. If you're in Vegas, I'm sure there's still tickets available. You can go on our website and do that. And they're honoring, you know, every year they honor a player uh, with the Bart Starr Award. Bart mm-hmm. Starr was a longtime NFL player with the Packers, devout Christian man, family man. And he passed away a few years ago. He played in the 60s with, with you know, Vince Lombardi and those old teams in the Green Bay Packers. But this award is one of the highest honored awards in the NFL because it's about character. It's about faith. It's about what you do off the field. And, you know, the Steelers Minka Fitzpatrick this year is the honoree. And so that man loves Jesus as well. He's going to be there and uh, it's going to be a really cool event. So, yeah, there is there is craziness. There is just mass chaos. But there's also time for worship. There's also time to see God get the glory in different different sectors like that. All right. I want you to check out everything that uh, Jason is doing and his colleagues at sportspectrum.com. There's a really great podcast um, where um, where Jason's talking with Sean Purdy um, and uh, about his son. That That's awesome. Don't miss that. I mean, just just look around. There's a piece about James Brown and how he intends to model godly godliness as he hosts the um the Super Bowl pregame show. Um so just on and on and on. Every angle you could imagine, um, you will see that God's got people literally in the game. Um he's got people yes. covering the game. He's got people on the sidelines of the game. And so as a Christian during this Super Bowl, let's be sure that we um we know their names. We point them out to others. Um and we, you know, we be team Jesus for the guys um who who are with Jesus in in the game and on the sidelines and even covering the sport. Jason, thanks so much for joining us and uh, and have a great time. Thank you, Carmen. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for inviting me, and I hope you guys have a great day. Yeah, you too. That's Jason Romano. Check it out, sportsspectrum.com. It's possible you'll just be watching um, the Super Bowl for the ads. I get that. I totally get that. Um, well, one of the things that is going to be happening during – uh, the advertisements during this Super Bowl um, are going to be ads for the He Gets Us um, project. And so not that I spend a lot of time reading Rolling Stone, but Rolling Stone actually is reporting on, I mean, this is kind of crazy to me. They are reporting on um, the Green family and the investment that the Green family, yes, Hobby Lobby Greens, um, it, it, the investment that they're making to support He Gets Us by airing ads during the Super Bowl. So um, I'm not necessarily uh, recommending the profile in Rolling Stone, but here's what I want to note. Rolling Stone has a profile of the Green family. (laughs) And so even if Rolling Stone hadn't intended to positively platform the He Gets Us campaign, um, they they have. They've done that. So David Green explains, um, uh, and he's quoted in this piece in Rolling Stone, uh, he's explaining why... Um, he gets us advertises during the Super Bowl because it is the most expensive television event of the year. And he said, well, we feel that the need as a group of Christians um, is to tell 350 million people because that's who's watching. And we feel that the need to tell 350 million people that God cares about you and that he gets you is really important. So in the article, there's another quote from David Green that says this. You know, as Christians, we're known as haters. We're beginning to be known as haters. You know, we hate this group or we hate that group, but that's not who we are. We are people that have the very, very best love story ever written. And we need to tell that love story. So our idea, well, let's tell the story. So as a Christian, you should love everybody. Jesus loved everybody. So Rolling Stone's now telling that love story to its readers. How are you and I telling that love story to others? That's the big question maybe for um, for us as we bring the He Gets Us campaign forward um, as a part of the ad campaign during the Super Bowl. Now, let me um, let me pivot and ask you this. Do you have an artistic outlet? Do you build stuff? Do you knit? Do you throw pottery? Like, what do you do? What's your thing? Timothy Gagno paints. 
and he's been using his brush strokes to share the gospel. So what does that look like? Well, that's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Do you have an artistic outlet? Um, Maybe you draw. Maybe you build with wood. Maybe you paint. Timothy Gagno is a painter, um, and he is using his brush strokes to glorify God. The Illuminated Messiah Bible is um, his latest work. Timothy, welcome to Mornings with Carmen. Thank you very much for having me. Excited to be here. Wow, this is beautiful. Let me just start with that. This is beautiful. Um, And so maybe um, talk about making the truth beautiful and, you know, what what it actually looks like to see Jesus revealed in all 66 books of the Bible in these individual paintings. But then when they come together, something extraordinary also happens. So tell people about the Illuminated Messiah Bible. Thanks. The Illuminated Messiah Bible, it's a collection of 66 original messianic portraits. I painted Jesus from every book in the Bible. And so I collected that all together. And uh, it connects the Old and the New Testament, all those passages about who the Messiah is and how we would recognize him when he comes. And then in the New Testament, all the places where Jesus fulfilled those great moments in the Bible. And so this is a five-year painted devotional uh, where I was thinking about the Messiah, and I was trying to figure out all of those things and searching Jesus uh, in the scriptures. And I'm able to share that with the readers in this brand new illuminated manuscript Bible. It's just, it's absolutely stunning. You have to see it for yourself illuminatedmessiah.com. I'm more than happy to send you the direct um, link. You know how to do that. Just text Just text me, 877-933-2484. This is one of those, you know, you, you, you've got to see it kinds of things. Because what happens, Timothy, when you put all of those images from, you know, seeing Jesus in all 66 books of the Bible, what happens when you put all of those images together? Yes. So this is what's called in the art world. It's a fancy art word. Uh, and it means uh, it's called a polyptych image. And so what? every what? What? single. What? Yeah. What is that? Fancy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, <laughs> a polyptych is a it's multiple paintings that join together to form a brand new, larger painting that's in many ways completely different. And so. Every single one of these 66 paintings, when you look at them individually throughout the Bible, you see a beautiful painting. You may see Moses parting the Red Sea. You might see a portrait of the Queen of Sheba. You might see Jonah and the and the great fish. Um, but all of those paintings combine together and they form a 12-foot cross. And when you look at the cross, you see that Moses parting the Red Sea is Jesus's toes. The Queen of Sheba is Jesus's kneecap. Jonah and the fish are his right wrist. So instead of seeing the individual paintings, you see Jesus crucified on the cross. And there's a poster of that that comes along with every copy of the Illuminated Messiah Bible. So if you buy the Bible, not only do you get all the 66 paintings, you get this poster that you can hang up and look at the polyptych cross image. Can you spell polyptych? <laughs> it's fancy. Um you know, it's a tough word to spell, but basically it's, I think it's P-O-L-Y-T-Y-C-H, something like that. I'm not, you know, I'm an artist, not a speller. I was just thinking, I know, but I was, <laughs> I know, but I was thinking like for Scrabble, I might, I need to add this word to, I'm a word person. And oh, I well, this add, is your new word. Yes. Okay. And you have, um, you have spelled it correctly, sir. You win the um, spelling bee prize um, for the day, nice. P-O-L-Y. P T Y C H, that's po- right. like poly, which would mean many, and then I don't know P T Y C H, which probably means picture in some language. So many pictures, lots of them together, making one picture. Hey, did you know that it was primarily or typically an altarpiece? I didn't know that. There you go. Yes, exactly. And this would make a great altarpiece uh, for a church. Oh yes, <laughs> twelve oh, feet tall. No, it's- It'd be a good. <laughs> it's stunning. It's just stunning. Okay. Um, I have so many questions. Um, 
I have so many questions about you as well, because, you know, you're you're you got some strange history, be, but it's not strange because you're a Christian and all of us have a strange history as a Christian prior to knowing Christ. Um, who were you before Jesus came to empower your life? Who, who were you? Uh, I you know, I, I was a pretty um, confused young man. I wasn't raised uh, to go to church. We were, I was, I grew up in a, in a, in a very small town. Uh, we were Catholic growing up, but we weren't devout Catholics by any stretch of the imagination. We were what you would call Christmas and Easter Catholics at best. And, uh, most of the people that I know, I mean, it was, I wasn't rare in this. Uh, we were raised that, you know, people that go to church too much, you get, you get a little wackadoo, you know, you get a little strange and odd. Now you're so thoroughly, you really want to for do the record. That. Just yeah. for the record, now now you're thoroughly wackadoo. But anyway, it's good. Yes. It's good wackadoo. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, I'm I'm good with wackadoo. But the um, and there's another word. I don't know how to spell that one either. But that's how I was raised. <laughs> I was raised that church wasn't important. God wasn't important. It wasn't a it wasn't a priority in our home. And so somewhere along the way, I started dabbling in the occult. And by the time I was about a junior in in high school, I was ridiculously involved in the occult and channeling spirits and playing with a Ouija board, probably eight hours a day. Um, it was just, I was deeply involved going down the wrong path. And um, at a certain point, I had a very wild encounter with what I instinctively knew was God. I was in the middle of casting spells in my room and I felt the presence of God drawing near to me. And it freaked me out and it scared the pajamas off of me. And I ran out of my house. I ran to the only anything to do with God I knew. I ran into uh, St. Joseph's Catholic Church and uh, ran straight into a confessional booth and uh, told the priest everything. And um, he was a little like, okay, Timmy, calm down, calm down. (laughs) And I'm like, no, you don't understand. God's in my room. He's trying to kill me. You got to talk to him for me. And the spirit of God followed me into the confessional booth. Like he knew where it was. And um, God began to speak to my heart and he said, stop it, come and follow me. And I knew it was Jesus. Don't ask me how I knew it was Jesus because I didn't know Jesus, but I knew it was Jesus. And he said, come and follow me. And I said, yes, I'm yours. Yes. And I started following him, but then I, I didn't have any, but when I left the confessional booth, nobody told me what happened. Nobody could explain to me. I just knew me and Jesus, I had to follow him. And I didn't know what that meant. And I didn't even know how to do that. I just knew I had to follow him. And uh, when I joined the military at 19, I met my first real person of faith. And he was my flight commander. And uh, first words he ever said to me was, I'm a Baptist. What are you? And I told him I was French because I had never heard the word Baptist before in my life. And he began to disciple me. He began to teach me, gave me my first real Bible. And um, he That was one of the first parts that brought me my art and my faith together because the way that he discipled me and the way that he got me to read my Bible was he would call me in his office and say, I'm doing a Sunday school class on David and Goliath. Can you paint me a picture of David and Goliath so that I can use it in my Sunday school class? And I'd say, Mm. sure. And he'd say, hold on now. I need it to be biblically accurate. And I'm like, ooh, what's that? (laughs) You know? And so he would take me on an hour long, two hour long Bible study on David and Goliath. And then I would paint the picture of David and Goliath for him. And he did that weekly for a very long time, going over the different parts of the Bible and making sure my paintings were biblically accurate and teaching me the Bible without me even, it was like the Jedi mind trick. I didn't even realize what was happening until I had completely fallen in love with the word of God and Mm -hmm. learning that my art can be used to glorify God. I'm so glad I asked um, that particular question because, wow, that was, that's just a feast. And we're going to, um, we're going to reach back in to some of the things that you just said, but we got to take a very, very brief break. Um, now I know you want to see, I know you want to see the illuminated uh, Messiah Bible, illuminatedmessiah.com. We're going to continue our conversation with Timothy Gagno in just a moment. Yeah, we're, um, yes, and we are now all making notes about um, about this flight commander and the way that he drew 
young Timothy into um, into the things of the faith. And and yeah, we're going to find out next. Like when you fall in love with the scripture, then how does God use you and your gifts um, to to glorify him in ways that you could have never imagined when you were a kid dabbling in the occult? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot there. All of, all of that and more next and more. Um, say the word one more time. The, the word where all the paintings come together as one. A polyptych image. Yeah. Polyptych. I don't know. Polyptych. Yeah. I'm going to practice that. It's a little bit of a party for your mouth. You could practice it too. We'll be right back. This is Mornings with Carmen. As we consider the life of Jesus and the life of the first generation of Christians, reading here the book of Acts and all the letters to the Christians in the New Testament, we see people who like wake up. They come to see and understand and then receive Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And it changes everything. We see Christians then telling other people about the good news and inviting them to respond in repentance, be baptized, and follow Jesus. The movement of Christianity grows person by person and then exponentially as people walking in darkness receive the light of Christ and want others to know what they know and have what they have. Well, you and I are living in dark days. People need light. And Jesus is the light of the world today in the same way that he was the light of the world at the beginning of creation and at the first Christmas and throughout his life on earth and in his radiance now at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the light of the world. So if you're walking in darkness of any kind today, I invite you to consider Jesus. If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. We are, um, we're talking about the way God meets us and empowers us by his Holy Spirit to share the good news of who he is with others um, through things that we love to do. And so for Timothy uh, Gagno, that is painting. Um, and with every brush um, stroke, um, he is not only helping us see Jesus, but um, he's delighting in him. And it's an act of worship. And I love all of that. It's devotional. It's it's just, it, and it's inspiring. So illuminatedmessiah.com is where you can see and experience um, the Illuminated Messiah Bible that we're talking about today. But now, Timothy, I just want to know more about your flight commander. Like, what is his name? Is he still alive? Can we talk to him? I wish you could. He he is actually, uh, he lives in a place called Niceville, Florida now. Uh, he actually, his name was Captain Mark Hayes. And uh, he, um, he, I think he retired as a colonel. Um, the last I had heard uh, before he retired, he was over at the Pentagon. Um, but uh, when, when we were serving together, it was at Tyndall Air Force Base. I was 19 years old, very young and naive. I mean, like, I mean, it was not a joke when he said, I'm a Baptist. I told him I was French because I had never heard the word before in my life. And uh, he really discipled me. There was another gentleman also uh, named uh, Chaplain Bruce Ewing. Uh, that that had a big effect on me during my military career, and both of them, they just saw, they saw my love for art, and my passion for art, and they also saw my passion for the Lord and His Word, and these two men really had an impact. They they, they nurtured that in me. They 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 saw potential in that, and they explained to me that you know God's going to use that if you let Him and you go for it. And I've been chasing God ever since with my art. Mm. It's so wonderful. Um, People can uh, obviously hear the light of Christ shining through you and the joy of your voice, but light also shines through your art. Um, When you use the term illumination or you describe your paintings as modern illuminations, I mean, this is the illuminated Messiah Bible. What what does that mean? An illumination is a really ancient art form uh, that was really famous in the 8th and ninth century. Yeah, you think of those old uh, medieval Bibles with the calligraphy and the text and the artwork and all of those. The Book of Kells is by far the most famous. It's actually called Medieval Europe's Greatest Treasure. So it's old Bibles from the Middle Ages. But the tradition of using art to glorify God actually goes way back, thousands of years, all the way back to the Jewish captivity in Babylon. 
And during that time period, the rabbis were kind of, they were mulling over Exodus chapter 15, verse two, where it talks about, I will exalt God. And the word exalt there was a little wonky and, and the, and the, the Jewish uh, scribes and, and rabbis were like, what is Moses trying to say with this word? It just doesn't seem right. And after debating and arguing and studying, they interpreted it to say, I will exalt God by creating beautiful things. And that just transforms what creating art is. It becomes an act of worship. And so they came up with a Hebrew tradition called Hidur Mitzvah, which literally means the beautification of the Torah or the beautification of the word of God. And so that's what I'm doing in modern times. That's what illuminated manuscript Bibles during the Middle Ages and what I'm doing today with the illuminated Messiah Bible is I am beautifying the word of God. I'm exalting God by creating the most beautiful Bible I am capable of doing. It's it's stunning. Um, it's really stunning. The other language that you use is narrative painting. Um, so the paintings tell a story like they they communicate the reality of the story. So this is not abstract, like you can tell what you're looking at when you see it. Yeah. And that, that was important to me. There are, there are a few other modern illuminations. This is only really the third true illuminated manuscript Bible since the printing press. When the printing press showed up, illuminations kind of went the way of the dinosaur. There's only been about three uh, since then, and this is the third, but the others use abstract art or non-representational art where you can't, you know, it's like you decide what it is with these, because I'm illuminating the key messianic passages from every book of the Bible, the main messianic theme from Genesis to Revelation, I need to tell the story of that. And I'm showing Jesus in every book of the Bible. So when I'm talking about the the passage where it says that the Messiah would be a man like Moses, I'm painting Moses parting the Red Sea. Um, You know, things like that matter. When I'm talking about how the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah, I paint the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, so I paint a pride of lions, you know, uh, 12 lions walking together and one big lion in the middle. So that's what a narrative painting is. You're, I'm taking those key scriptures and I'm telling the story with realism, with realistic paintings that you can tell what's going on. I have loved meeting you today. Um, your work is glorifying to God and edifying to the human spirit. Thank you so much um, for what you do. Keep painting and come back and talk with us again. Oh, I would love it. Love to do it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. That is our brother in Christ, Timothy Gagno. The book, um, I it's even I hardly want to call it a book. The work of art is the Illuminated Messiah Bible. You can check it out at Illuminated Messiah dot com. Um, All right. Circling back around to the way I started, I had no idea why this morning I just felt compelled to lead off the show by asking you, hey, good looking, what you got cooking? Well, now I know why. Carol is listening. And that was the greeting that she heard more than 40 years ago um, um, at a school athletic banquet with her mom. Um, And she and Dean, by the way, shout out to Dean, who thought that would be a good way to get that girl to sit down um, with him at a table. Dean said, hey, good looking, what you got cooking? Well, Carol and Dean are celebrating 38 years of marriage in May. Yeah, 42 years together since they became high school sweethearts. So try it out today. You could just ask somebody, hey, good looking, what you got cooking? Um, you know, break bread, let Jesus be known um, to others. Don't be, don't be shy and don't, shine, don't shy away. Go be shiny. Use your art. Um, use your words. Use the gift of the Spirit. Yes, and circling back to the very beginning of the first hour, Spare a square if that's the way that God leads you to love someone today. You can spare a square. I know you can. Every square inch belongs to him. Yeah, even that square inch. Have a great day. Great, great day. And God bless. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBerge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.